Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One by Henry Charles Lee. Book One, Chapter Three The Jews and the Conversos, Part Two. These provisions indicate the direction in which Dominican zeal was striving to curtail the privileges so long enjoyed by the Jews, and the royal intention to protect them against local legislation, which had doubtless been attempted under this impulsion. They were not remiss in gratitude, for when, in 1274, Jaime attended the Council of Lyon, they contributed 71,000 sueldos to enable him to appear with fitting magnificence. The royal protection was speedily needed, for the tide of persecuting zeal was rising among the clergy, and, shortly after his return from Lyon, on a good Friday, the ecclesiastics of Gerona rang the bells, summoned the populace, and attacked the Juderia which was one of the largest and most flourishing in Catalonia. They would have succeeded in destroying it, but for the interposition of Jaime, who chanced to be in the city, and who defended the Jews with force of arms. After the death of Jaime in 1276, the ecclesiastics seemed to have thought that they could safely obey the commands of Clement IV, especially as Nicholas IV, in 1278, instructed the Dominican general to depute pious brethren everywhere to convoke the Jews and labor for their conversion, with the significant addition that lists of those refusing baptism were to be made out and submitted to him when he would determine what was to be done with them. How the frailes interpreted the papal utterances is indicated in a letter of Pedro the Third to Pedro Bishop of Gerona, in April of this same year, 1278, reciting that he had already appealed repeatedly to him to put an end to the assaults of the clergy on the Jews, and now he learns that they have again attacked the Juderia, stoning it from the tower of the cathedral and from their own houses, and then assaulting it, laying waste the gardens and vineyards of the Jews, and even destroying their graves and, when the royal herald stood up to forbid the work, drowning his voice with yells and derisions. Pedro accuses the bishop of stimulating the clergy to these outrages, and orders him to put a stop to it and punish the offenders. He was still more energetic when the French crusade under Philippe Léardy was advancing to the siege of Gerona in 1285 and his Moorish soldiers in the garrison undertook to sack the Kal Yudich or Juderia, when he threw himself among them, mace in hand, struck down a number, and finished by hanging several of them. He offered no impediment, however, to the conversion of the Jews, for in 1279 he ordered his officials to compel them to listen to the Franciscans, who, in obedience to the commands of the Pope, might wish to preach to them in their synagogues. These intrusions of Phileus into the Juderias inevitably led to trouble, for there is significance in a letter of Jaime II, April 4, 1305, to his representative in Palma, alluding to recent scandals, for the future prevention of which he orders that no priest shall enter the Juderia to administer the sacraments without being accompanied by a secular official. This precaution was unavailing, for it doubtless was a continuance of such provocation that led to a disturbance about 1315 affording to King Jaime an excuse for confiscating the whole property of the Aljama of Palma and then commuting the penalty to a fine of 95,000 libras. The source of these troubles is suggested by a royal order of 1327 to the governor of Majorca, 
forbidding the baptism of Jewish children under seven years of age, or the forcible baptism of Jews of any age. During all this period there had been an inquisition in Aragon, which, of course, could not interfere with Jews as such, for they were beyond its jurisdiction, but which stood ready to punish any more or less veritable efforts at propagandism or offenses of fautorship. The crown had no objection to using it as a means of extortion, while preventing it from exterminating or crippling subjects so useful. A diploma of Jaime II, October 14, 1311, recites that the inquisitor, Fray Juan Latger, had learned that the aljamas of Barcelona, Tarragona, Montblanc, and Villafranca had harbored and fed certain Jewish converts who had relapsed to Judaism, as well as others who had come from foreign parts. He had given Fray Juan the necessary support, enabling him to verify the accusations on the spot and had received his report to that effect. Now, therefore, he issues a free and full pardon to the offending aljamas with assurance that they shall not be prosecuted, either civilly or criminally, for which grace, on October 10th, they had paid him 10,000 sueldos. In this case there seems to have been no regular trial by the Inquisition, the king having superseded it by his action. In another more serious case he intervened after trial and sentence to commute the punishment. In 1326 the Alhama of Calatayu subjected itself to the Inquisition by not only receiving back a woman who had been baptized, but by circumcising two Christians. Tried by the Inquisitor and the Bishop of Tarazona, it had been found guilty, and it had been sentenced to a fine of 20,000 sueldos and its members to confiscation. But King Jaime, by a cedula of February the 6th, 1326, released them from the confiscation and all other penalties on payment of the fine. Although Castile was slower than Aragon to receive impulses from abroad, in the early 14th century we begin to find traces of a similar movement of the Church against the Jews. In 1307 the Aljama of Toledo complained to Fernando IV that the dean and chapter had obtained from Clement V bulls conferring on them jurisdiction over Jews, in virtue of which they were enforcing the canons against usury and stripping the Jewish community of its property. At this time there was no question in Spain, such as we shall see debated hereafter, of the royal prerogative to control obnoxious papal letters, and Fernando at once ordered the chapter to surrender the bulls. All action under them was pronounced void, and restitution in double was threatened for all damage inflicted. The Jews, he said, were his Jews. They were not to be incapacitated from paying their taxes, and the Pope had no power to infringe on the rights of the crown. He instructed Ferran Núñez de Pantoja to compel obedience, and after some offenders had been arrested, the frightened canons surrendered the bulls and abandoned their promising speculation but the affair left behind it enmities which displayed themselves deplorably afterwards. In spite of the royal favor and protection, the legislation of the period commences to manifest a tendency to limit the privileges of the Jews, showing that popular sentiment was gradually turning against them. As early as 1286, Sancho IV agreed to deprive them of their special judges, and, though the law was not generally enforced, it indicates the spirit that called for it and procured its repetition in the Cortes of Valladolid in 1307. Complaints were loud and numerous of the Jewish tax-gatherers, and the young Fernando IV was obliged repeatedly to promise that the revenue should not be farmed out, nor their collection be entrusted to caballeros, ecclesiastics, or Jews the turbulence which attended his minority and short reign, and the minority of his son, Alfonso the Eleventh, 
afforded a favorable opportunity for the manifestation of hostility, and the royal power was too weak to prevent the curtailment in various directions of the Jewish privileges. We have seen in the preceding chapter the temper in which the Spanish prelates returned from the Council of Vienne in 1312, and the proscriptive legislation enacted by them in the Council of Zamora, in 1313 and its successors. Everything favored the development of this spirit of intolerance, and at the Cortes of Burgos in 1315 the regents of the young Alfonso XI conceded that the Clementine canon, abrogating all laws that permitted usury, should be enforced, that all mixed actions, civil and criminal, should be tried by the royal judges, that the evidence of a Jew should not be received against a Christian, while that of a Christian was good against a Jew, that Jews were not to assume Christian names, Christian nurses were not to suckle Jews, and sumptuary laws were directed against the luxury of Jewish vestments. This may be said to mark the commencement of the long struggle, which in spite of their wonderful powers of resistance, was to end in the destruction of the Spanish Jews. Throughout the varying phases of the conflict, the Church, in its efforts to arouse popular hatred, was powerfully aided by the odium which the Jews themselves excited through their ostentation, their usury, and their functions as public officials. A strong race is not apt to be an amiable one. The Jews were proud of their ancient lineage and the purity of their descent from the kings and heroes of the Old Testament. A man who could trace his ancestry to David would look with infinite scorn on the Hidalgos who boasted of the blood of Lain Calvo, and, if the favor of the monarch rendered safe the expression of his feelings, his haughtiness was not apt to win friends among those who repaid his contempt with interest. The oriental fondness for display was a grievous offense among the people. The wealth of the kingdom was, to a great extent, in Jewish hands, affording ample opportunity of contrast between their magnificence and the poverty of the Christian multitude, and the lavish extravagance with which they adorned themselves, their women, and their retainers, was well fitted to excite envy more potent for evil, because more widespread, than enmity arising from individual wrongs. Shortly before the catastrophe, at the close of the fifteenth century, Afonso V of Portugal, who was well affected towards them, asked the chief rabbi, Yosef ben Yahia, why he did not prevent his people from a display provocative of the assertion that their wealth was derived from robbery of the Christians, adding that he required no answer, for nothing save spoliation and massacre would cure them of it. A more practical and far-reaching cause of enmity was the usury, through which a great portion of their wealth was acquired. The money-lender has everywhere been an unpopular character, and in the Middle Ages he was especially so. When the Church pronounced any interest or any advantage, direct or indirect, derived from loans to be a sin for which the sinner could not be admitted to penance without making restitution. When the justification of taking interest was regarded as a heresy to be punished as such by the Inquisition, a stigma was placed on the money-lender, his gains were rendered hazardous, and his calling became one which an honorable Christian could not follow. Mercantile Italy early outgrew these dogmas, which retarded so greatly all material development, and it managed to reconcile, per fas et nefas, the canons with the practical necessities of business. But elsewhere throughout Europe, wherever Jews were allowed to exist, the lending of money or goods on interest inevitably fell, for the most part, into their hands, for they were governed by their own moral code and were not subject to the church. It exhausted all devices to coerce them through their rulers, but the object aimed at was too incompatible with the necessities of advancing civilization to have any influence save the indefinite postponement of relief to the borrower. The unsavoriness of the calling, 
its risks and the scarcity of coin during the Middle Ages conspired to render the current rates of interest exorbitantly oppressive. In Aragon, the Jews were allowed to charge 20% per annum, in Castile, 33, and the constant repetition of these limitations and the provisions against all manner of ingenious devices by fictitious sales and other frauds to obtain an illegal increase show how little the laws were respected in the grasping avarice with which the Jews speculated on the necessities of their customers. In 1326, the Alhama of Cuenca, considering the legal rate of 33% too low, refused absolutely to lend either money or wheat for the sowing. This caused great distress, and the town council entered into negotiations, resulting in an agreement by which the Jews were authorized to charge 40%. In 1385, the Cortes of Valladolid describe one cause of the necessity of submitting to whatever exactions the Jews saw fit to impose, when it says that the new lords, to whom Henry of Trastamara had granted towns and villages, were accustomed to imprison their vassals and starve and torture them to force payment of what they had not got, obliging them to get money from Jews, to whom they gave whatever bonds were demanded. Monarchs as well as peasants were subject to these impositions. In Navarre, a law of Felipe III in 1330 limited the rate of interest to 20%, and we find this paid by his grandson, Carlos III, in 1399, for a loan of 1,000 florins. But in 1401, he paid at the rate of 35% for a loan of 2,000 florins. And in 1402, his queen, Doña Leonor, borrowed 70 florins from her Jewish physician, Abraham, at four florins a month, giving him silver plate as security. Finding at the end of 21 months that the interest amounted to 84 florins, she begged a reduction, and he contented himself with 30 florins. When money could be procured in no other way, when the burgher had to raise it to pay his taxes or the extortions of his lord, and the husbandman had to procure seed corn or starve, it is easy to see how all had to submit to the exactions of the money lender. How, in spite of occasional plunder and scaling of debts, the Jews absorbed the floating capital of the community and how recklessly they aided the frailes in concentrating popular detestation on themselves. It was in vain that the Ordenamiento de Alcalá in 1348 prohibited usury to Moors and Jews as well as to Christians. It was an inevitable necessity, and it continued to flourish. Equally effective in arousing antipathy were the functions of the Jews as holders of office, and especially as almoharifes and recabdores, farmers of the revenues and collectors of taxes, which brought them into the closest and most exasperating relations with the people. In that age of impoverished treasuries and rude financial expedients, the customary mode of raising funds was by farming out the revenues to the highest bidder of specific sums, as the profit of the speculation depended on the amount to be wrung from the people, the subordinate collectors would be merciless in exaction and indefatigable in tracing out delinquents, exciting odium which extended to all the race. It was in vain that the church repeatedly prohibited the employment of Jews in public office. Their ability and skill rendered them indispensable to monarchs, nobles, and prelates, and the complaints which rose against them on all sides were useless. Thus, in the quarrel between the chapter of Toledo and the great Archbishop Rodrigo, in which the former appealed to Gregory the Ninth in 1236, one of the grievances alleged is that he appointed Jews to be provosts of the common table of the chapter, thus enabling them to defraud the canons. They even passed through the church and often entered the chapter house itself to the great scandal of all Christians. They collected the tithes and thirds and governed the vassals and possessions of the church, greatly enriching themselves by plundering the patrimony of the crucified. 
wherefore the Pope was earnestly prayed to expel the Jews from these offices and compel them to make restitution. When prelates such as Archbishop Rodrigo paid so little heed to the commands of the Church, it is not to be supposed that monarchs were more obedient, or were more disposed to forego the advantages derivable from the services of these accomplished financiers. How these men assisted their masters while enriching themselves is exemplified by Don Sa de la Maleja al Moharife Mayor to Alfonso X. When the king in 1257 was raising an army to subdue Aben Nothfolt, king of Niebla, Don Sa undertook to defray all the expenses of the campaign in consideration of the assignment to him of certain taxes some of which he was still enjoying in 1272. It was useless for the people who groaned under the exactions of these efficient officials to protest against their employment and to extort from the monarchs repeated promises no longer to employ them. The promises were never kept, and until the reign of Ferdinand and Isabella this source of irritation continued. There was, it is true, one exception— the result of which was not conducive to a continuance of the experiment. In 1385 the Cortes of Valladolid obtained from Juan I a decree prohibiting the employment of Jews as tax collectors, not only by the king, but also by prelates and nobles, in consequence of which ecclesiastics obtained the collection of the royal revenues but when they were called upon to settle they excommunicated the alcaldes who sought to compel payment, leading to great confusion and bitterer complaints than ever. When the Jews thus gave ground so ample for popular dislike, it says much for the kindly feeling between the races that the efforts of the Church to excite a spirit of intolerance made progress so slow. These took form as a comprehensive and systematic movement at the Council of Zamora in 1313 and its successors described in the preceding chapter, but in spite of them Alfonso XI continued to protect his Jewish subjects, and the labors of the good fathers awoke no particular response. In Aragon a canon of the Council of Lerida in 1325, forbidding Christians to be present at Jewish weddings and circumcisions, shows how fruitless as yet had been the effort to produce mutual alienation. Navarre had the earliest foretaste of the wrath to come. It was then under its French princes, and when Charles Le Bel died, February 1, 1328, a zealous Franciscan, Fray Pedro Oligoyen, apparently taking advantage of the interregnum, stirred with his eloquent preaching, the people to rise against the Jews, and led them to pillage and slaughter. The storm burst on the Aljama of Estela, March 1st, and rapidly spread throughout the kingdom. Neither age nor sex was spared, and the number of victims is variously estimated at from six to ten thousand. Queen Jean and her husband, Philippe Leverot, who succeeded to the throne, caused Olegoyen to be prosecuted, but the result is not known. They further speculated on the terrible massacre by imposing heavy fines on Estela and Viana, and by seizing the property of the dead and fugitive Jews, and they also levied on the ruined Alhamas the sum of 15,000 livres to defray their coronation expenses. Thus fatally weakened, the Jews of Navarre were unable to endure the misfortunes of the long and disastrous reign of Charles le Mauvais, 1350-1387. A general emigration resulted, to arrest which Charles prohibited the purchase of landed property from Jews without special royal license. A list of taxables in 1366 shows only 453 Jewish families and 150 Moorish, not including Pampeluna, where both races are taxable by the bishop. Although Charles and his son, Charles Le Noble, 1387-1425, had Jews for Almoharifes, it was in vain that they endeavored to allure the fugitives back by privileges and exemptions. 
the aljamas continued to dwindle until the revenue from them was inconsiderable in castile and aragon the black death caused massacres of jews as elsewhere throughout europe though not so widespread and terrible in catalonia the troubles commenced at barcelona and spread to other places in spite of the efforts of pedro the fourth both in prevention and punishment they had little special religious significance but were rather the result of the relaxation of social order in the fearful disorganization accompanying the pestilence and after it had passed the survivors christians jews and mudejares were for a moment knit more closely together in the bonds of a common humanity it is to the credit of clement the sixth that he did what he could to arrest the fanaticism which especially in germany offered to the jews the alternative of death or baptism following as he said in the footsteps of calixtus the second eugenius the third alexander the third clement the third Colestin the third innocent the third gregory the ninth nicholas the third honorius the fourth and nicholas the fourth he pointed out the absurdity of attributing the plague to the jews they had offered to submit to judicial examination and sentence besides which the pestilence raged in lands where there were no jews he therefore ordered all prelates to proclaim to the people assembled for worship that jews were not to be beaten wounded or slain, and that those who so treated them were subjected to the anathema of the Holy See. It was a timely warning, and worthy of one who spoke in the name of Christ, but it availed little to overcome the influence of the assiduous teaching of intolerance through so many centuries. When Pedro the Cruel ascended to the throne of Castile in 1350, the Jews might reasonably look forward to a prosperous future, but his reign in reality proved the turning point in their fortunes he surrounded himself with jews and confided to them the protection of his person while the rebellious faction headed by henry of trastamara his illegitimate brother declared themselves the enemies of the race and used pedro's favor for them as a political weapon he was asserted to be a jew substituted for a girl born of queen maria whose husband, Alfonso XI, was said to have sworn that he would kill her if she did not give him a boy. It was also reported that he was no Christian, but an adherent of the law of Moses, and that the government of Castile was wholly in the hands of Jews. It was not difficult, therefore, to arouse clerical hostility, as manifested by Urban V, who denounced him as a rebel to the church, a fautor of jews and moors a propagator of infidelity and a slayer of christians of this the insurgents took full advantage and demonstrated their piety in the most energetic manner when in thirteen fifty five henry of trastamara and his brother the master of santiago entered toledo to liberate queen blanche who was confined in the alcazar they sacked the smaller Juderia and slew its twelve hundred inmates without sparing sex or age. They also besieged the principal Juderia, which was walled around, and, defended by Pedro's followers until his arrival with reinforcements, drove off the assailants. Five years later, when, in 1360, Henry of Trastamara invaded Castile with the aid of Pedro the Fourth of Aragon, on reaching Najara, he ordered a massacre of the Jews, and, as Ayala states that this was done to win popularity, it may be assumed that free license for pillage was granted. Apparently stimulated by this example, the people of Miranda del Ebro, led by Pero Martinez, son of the precentor, and by Pero Sanchez de Banuelas, fell upon Jews in their town, but King Pedro hastened thither, and as a deterrent example, boiled one leader and roasted the other. When at length, in 1366, Henry led into Spain Bertrand de Guesclin and his hordes of free companions, the slaughter of the Jews was terrible. 
multitudes fled, and the French chronicler deplores the number that sought refuge in Paris and preyed upon the people with their usuries. The Aljama of Toledo purchased exemption with a million of maravedis, raised in ten days, to pay off the mercenaries, but as the whole land lay for a time at the mercy of the reckless bands, slaughter and pillage were general. Finally, the fratricide at Montiel in 1369 deprived the Jews of their protector and left Henry undisputed master of Castile. What they had to expect from him was indicated by his levying June 6, 1369, within three months of his brother's murder, 20,000 doblas on the Juderia of Toledo, and authorizing the sale at auction not only of the property of the inmates, but of their persons into slavery, or their imprisonment in chains with starvation or torture, until the amount should be raised. It was doubtless to earn popularity that about the same time he released all Christians and Moors from obligation to pay debts due to Jews, though he was subsequently persuaded to rescind this decree, which would have destroyed the ability of the Jews to pay their imposts. End of Book 1, Chapter 3, Part 2